It was February of 1984, and 25-year-old Terry Brooks had just landed her perfect job. As the young woman with bright blue eyes and shoulder-length blonde hair backed her car out of her parents' driveway and headed west towards the Oxford Valley Mall, she glanced at her watch. Terry had always made a point of being on time, but as the brand new assistant manager of a busy and popular fast food restaurant, she now made a point of arriving a little bit early. Not so early that she got underfoot of the waitstaff or appeared to be that over-eager manager who was looking over everybody's shoulders at how they were doing their jobs, but Terry had only been assigned to this Roy Rogers restaurant in Bucks County, Pennsylvania one week before, and so she wanted to make sure that she set a positive example as a capable, reliable manager who was friendly, but also very professional. As Terry drove the 13 miles from her parents' neat house in the quiet suburb of Warminster to the busy intersection of Route 1 and Oxford Valley Road in Fairless Hills, she hardly noticed the unusually warm weather. Even though it was a surprising and welcome change from eastern Pennsylvania's typical chilly winter afternoons. In fact, Terry's life recently had been so busy and so full of changes and plans that the only remarkable thing about her commute to work was that it offered her a rare 30 minutes of quiet where she could try to organize her thoughts and prepare herself for the 10-hour shift ahead of her. It wasn't the actual work that Terry worried about. She already knew from past experience a lot about what went on inside of a restaurant. Ever since high school and right through the summers that she had spent home from college, Terry had done what most of her friends had also done, gotten summer jobs and part-time jobs as servers at local eateries. But once Terry had graduated from the University of Maryland almost four years ago with a degree in personnel management, she had decided to parlay that real-life work experience into a corporate job that would be a step closer to a professional career in the food service industry or in human resources. So about seven months earlier, back in July of 1983, Terry had left her longtime job as manager at a local Italian restaurant called Cucci's in her hometown of Warminster and taken a job with Roy Rogers, a chain of fast food restaurants that was owned by the Marriott Corporation, one of the country's giants in the hospitality industry. Even though the move meant that Terry would be taking an initial pay cut and that she would start with the Roy Rogers team not as a manager but as an assistant manager, Terry did not for a minute second-guess her decision to leave Coochie's. Because for Terry, taking charge of her life was something that came naturally. When her parents divorced back when Terry was in the eighth grade, the four Brooks children had gone to live with their father, George Brooks. Older than her two younger sisters and their youngest brother, Terry had immediately taken on more responsibility for her siblings. And even after her father had remarried, Terry was known to her family and friends for her dependability and her unwavering sense of purpose. As Terry's good friend, Cindy Bradney, who was a bartender at Coochie's Restaurant, put it, Terry was one of the few people in their circle of friends in Warminster who had gone to college and who had come back home with a plan for going on to bigger and better things. But Terry's good looks and outstanding academic performance, along with her ambition and intelligence, was coupled with such genuine friendliness and kindness that she was more likely to inspire affection and trust than she was to inspire envy. And that was saying a lot, because in the early winter of 1984, it looked like Terry was living the kind of charmed life that everybody wants to have. After finishing college, Terry had made the difficult but very smart decision to end a serious relationship that had become strained and even physically abusive. And when Terry had fallen in love again, almost a year ago, it was with a 22-year-old local man who was a cook at Coochie's, where she used to work. Unlike Terry or her ex-boyfriend, Albert Scott Keefe, who went by his middle name, Scott, had not gone to college. But he was a hard worker, and he appreciated that combination of warmth and competence that made Terry really stand out from the crowd. Turning her attention away from the road just for a moment, Terry glanced down at the engagement ring on her left hand. She and Scott had known within weeks of meeting each other at Coochie's that their mutual attraction would lead to more than just a casual workplace romance. And sure enough, three months later, Scott had asked Terry to marry him. And with a radiant smile, Terry had said yes. Since then, the couple had been busy working and saving money for their upcoming wedding, which was planned for July 14th. With Scott living at his mom's house, just three miles from where Terry was living with her parents, the two of them had just decided the week before that they could afford to put money down on a 10-day honeymoon to Hawaii. 
The moment the two of them had walked into the travel agency in nearby Doylestown, Pennsylvania, three days ago, it had been both exciting and nerve-wracking. For Terry, the sight of the brochures that described Hawaii's sandy beaches, rugged coastlines, waterfalls, rainforests, and volcanoes suddenly made both the honeymoon and the wedding seem not only very real, but also very close. As Terry passed by the shops and strip malls and slices of farmland and cornfields that stretched out along either side of Route 132 East, she suddenly felt overwhelmed. There was so much to do and plan over the next five and a half weeks, starting with the shopping trip she and her stepmother would make tomorrow to see if they could find a wedding gown for Terry. For Scott, Terry's career change also meant a few adjustments, mostly that Terry's new job with Roy Rogers meant that they would no longer see each other every day at Coochie's, where they both used to work. But Terry and her family had appreciated the effort Scott made to check in on her now that she was working the night shift at a restaurant much further away from her home in Warminster. Although the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers was not located in a high crime area, the clientele and overall vibe of the restaurant were very different from that of Coochie's. Instead of a local customer base and quiet location, Terry's Roy Rogers was stationed right at the intersection of two heavily used major roadways. By design, the fast food restaurant with its western theme and signature roast beef sandwiches was a brightly lit glass-sided cube of warmth and invitation that was intended to entice an endless stream of hungry travelers, many of whom would never return. But so far, any trouble that Terry had experienced at work had not come from customers. Instead, it had come from Roy Rogers' staff. Two months earlier, while training at a different Roy Rogers, Terry had had a very nasty confrontation with an employee who outright refused to follow a simple order she had given him. Instead, Steve Daly blew up at her, called her terrible names, and became physically aggressive. Management had immediately fired this guy, but for a while, he still came back to the restaurant as a customer and sat glowering at Terry and her staff from one of the tables. More recently, at the Roy Rogers in Fairless Hills, her Roy Rogers, as she liked to remind herself, there had been an issue with one of the cash registers coming up $40 short at the end of a shift. Terry had had her suspicions about an employee named Barb who worked at her location but soon after Terry had confronted her staff, the missing money had turned up, returned to the safe in an unmarked envelope. So it was probably no wonder, Terry thought to herself as she approached the intersection of North Oxford Road and US Route 1, that Scott was concerned about her safety and often came to sit in the restaurant after closing to make sure she and any other late night staff were not left there alone. Seeing the Roy Rogers sign in the distance, Terry reminded herself to call Scott later that evening and tell him that she'd be later than usual that night since she had to catch up on some important paperwork. As Terry turned on her car blinker and prepared to enter the Roy Rogers parking lot, she also made a mental note to let Scott know that she'd be fine. There was no need for him to come by and sit with her. It was Friday, February 3rd, and Terry knew Scott had an early shift the next morning and there would be two teenagers staying there with her in the restaurant cleaning until about 1.30 a.m. So Scott didn't need to worry. Terry would not be alone. A minute later, and Terry had parked the car and turned off the engine. As she gathered her brown purse and slipped her car keys into the pocket of her light purple jacket, she glanced at herself in the rearview mirror. Straightening the collar of her Roy Rogers maroon dress shirt, Terry felt a thrill of accomplishment and hope. She'd only been working for the Marriott Corporation less than a year, but already Terry had learned so much about running a business and being a supervisor. And even the recent challenges had given her a chance to apply some of what she had learned in college about personnel management. And those conflicts had also been good practice on how to stand up for herself and be authoritative when it came to expressing expectations and consequences. A few minutes later, her blonde hair glowing under the light spilling out of the big glass windows of the wood-framed restaurant, Terry stepped up to the outer door leading into her Roy Rogers. At 6.45 a.m. the next morning, Saturday, February 4th, 1984, Scott was passing by Terry's parents' house on his way to work when he noticed that Terry's car was not parked in its usual spot in the Brooks' driveway. Puzzled, Scott slowed down. 
At 10 p.m. the night before, Terry had called him to say she'd be working late. Terry had been very busy, so their conversation was short, but Scott was sure he remembered every word correctly. Honey, don't worry about me, Terry had told him. I have some paperwork to finish tonight, but there are two other people that will be here with me. Coming to a sudden decision, Scott pulled his truck up to the curb. Despite the early hour, he decided to check in with Terry's parents just to make sure Terry had made it home okay the night before. Hopping out of his truck and heading for the front door of the house, Scott glanced at his watch. He was probably worrying for no reason, and he'd be back on the road in just a minute. And besides, even with the unplanned stop he was making, he'd still have enough time before his shift even started to enjoy a cigarette and a cup of coffee once he arrived at work. But a few minutes later, Scott was sitting down inside the Brooks' kitchen, staring at Terry's parents with a stunned look on his face. Both Elizabeth and George Brooks had just checked Terry's bedroom and found that it was empty. The bed was made, and there was no sign anywhere in the house of their oldest daughter. As Terry's 51-year-old father stepped to the kitchen phone and dialed the number of the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers restaurant 30 minutes away, Scott pushed himself slowly to his feet, and he and Terry's mother, Elizabeth, leaned forward, straining to hear the voice on the other end of the line. The call was answered by a police officer. One hour earlier, at about 6 a.m., the manager of the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers had arrived, as he always did on Saturday mornings, to open up the restaurant and get things ready for the breakfast shift. It wasn't until Joseph Hampton reached the front door and found it unlocked that he had the first inkling that something might be wrong. There was a second inner door to the restaurant that stayed open during business hours, but locked automatically when staff closed it behind them and left for the night. But this outer door had to be locked using a key, and obviously someone had failed to do that. Suddenly alert, the manager stepped inside, unlocked the second door, and turned to look at the tables and booths in the dining area. Seeing that nothing appeared to be out of order, he relaxed slightly as he stepped behind the counter with its bank of cash registers into the small rectangular prep area in the entryway to the kitchen. That's when he stopped. In a faint glow of light shining out from the partially closed office door ahead of him, the manager could just make out the shape of a human body. Terry Brooks lay on her back on the red tiled floor. Dressed in her short purple winter coat, her purse and keys and shoes were all scattered in the space around her. Standing there in the semi-darkness, it took Joseph a moment to recognize who she was, because Terry's head was completely wrapped in one of the big plastic bags that should have been lining the nearby trash can, and just below the bag, there was the wooden handle of a butcher knife sticking out of Terry's throat. Within minutes of receiving Joseph's frantic 911 call at 6.12 a.m., the first officers and emergency medical personnel from the Falls Township Police Department were rolling in to the Roy Rogers parking lot, lights flashing and officers already preparing to close off the perimeter of the restaurant with yellow crime scene tape. When Terry's father called Roy Rogers' restaurant that morning at about 7 a.m., his wife Elizabeth would later remember every word of the short exchange. This is George Brooks, Terry Brooks' father. Terry didn't come home last night. Is she okay? George's wife and Terry's fiance did not have to strain to hear the police officer's answer. No, she's not. She's been murdered. It did not take the lead detectives on the case very long to form a theory of what had happened inside the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers restaurant in the early hours of Saturday, February 4th. Because not only was Terry Brooks dead with no sign that she had been sexually assaulted, but also the store safe had been left wide open and more than $2,700 was missing. To detectives George Mitchell and Tim Stefan, that and everything else about the scene and the likely time of the murder pointed to a robbery homicide. According to early interviews with restaurant staff, Terry had sent two teenagers, who had given the restaurant its final cleaning, home at about 1.30 a.m. And even though restaurant protocol required a minimum of two staff in the restaurant at closing, Terry had decided to stay a little longer by herself to finish her paperwork. Then, dressed to leave work in her coat, with her purse and keys in hand, police theorized that Terry's attacker may have waited for her outside and gained entry to the safe and money by pushing Terry back inside the restaurant as she was leaving. If Terry had fought back, the robber may have panicked and killed her. 
Police also considered the possibility that someone had entered the restaurant before it closed and had hidden somewhere inside with the intent of robbing the safe. In either scenario, robbery and money were the primary motives, and Terry, tragically, was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it wasn't just the crime scene that suggested this had been a robbery gone wrong, it was this particular robbery against a backdrop of other recent robberies in the same region. During the last several months, law enforcement in and around Bucks County, Pennsylvania, had received so many reports of restaurants being burglarized that police and the media had nicknamed the perpetrator, or perpetrators, the Freezer Bandits. But given the brutality of Terry's murder, police also considered the possibility that there was a personal element to the crime, and that one of Terry's co-workers was the robber, and they had disliked her enough that, finding her inside the restaurant, they decided to kill her. Even as crime scene techs were busy gathering physical evidence at Roy Rogers, and the deputy coroner was collecting evidence from Terry's body, police investigators were at the Brooks residence out in Warminster, taking statements from Scott and Terry's parents. Since the majority of homicides are committed by a spouse or partner, Scott was an obvious person of interest. But there was nothing in Scott's story or in statements from Terry's friends and family that suggested he had a motive or connection to the crime. Terry's mother confirmed that her daughter had called Scott at about 10 p.m. the night before to say she was working late and he didn't need to stop by. And according to Elizabeth, there was nothing to indicate that the couple had quarreled or that the phone conversation was anything other than affectionate. And there was nothing in the couple's recent behavior that suggested trouble. Just three days earlier, Scott and Terry had paid for their honeymoon to Hawaii, and on the day of her murder, Terry and her stepmom had been looking forward to going shopping together for Terry's wedding gown. Where police did see red flags was in the description they heard from family and friends about Terry's relationship with her ex-boyfriend. And at the same time that investigators were tracking down that lead and corroborating the statements of Scott and Terry's family and friends, Detectives interviewing Terry's co-workers quickly learned about Terry's confrontation two months ago with Steve Daly that had led to him being fired. And they also heard about the more recent incident involving the $40 missing from one of the Roy Rogers cash registers. But it wasn't long before Township Falls investigators pursuing all of these various leads began running into one dead end after another. In quick succession, they eliminated Terry's old boyfriend, as well as Steve Daly, from the suspect list. The ex-boyfriend had moved to California and had an airtight alibi. As for Steve Daly, he also had an alibi, and he passed a lie detector test. Another Roy Rogers employee, whose fingerprints were found on the sill of the drive through window that Terry's attacker had almost certainly used as an escape route, as well as on the plastic bag that was wrapped around Terry's head, also passed a lie detector test. And in addition to having an alibi, the presence of that employee's fingerprints was explained by the fact that he had worked at the drive through window and that he had also placed the bag wrapped around Terry's head into the trash can from which the bag had later been removed. It wasn't until late February and early March that the investigation suddenly regained momentum. That's when two more female workers at fast food restaurants within a 100-mile radius of Fairless Hills were attacked in separate incidents. Both crimes appeared to be robberies, and at one of the restaurants, the young woman was stabbed to death. But the man arrested for that murder turned out to have no connection to Terry's death. And by the end of March, police had also captured the so-called freezer bandits and determined that they too had no connection to Terry's death. By July 14, 1984, the date set for Terry and Scott to get married, the investigation into the murder of Terry Brooks had gone cold. Despite a $5,000 reward from the Marriott Corporation for information that would lead to the arrest of Terry's murderer, and despite asking for help from law enforcement in other states, as well as from the FBI, and at the request of Terry's family, even consulting three psychics, the Falls Township Police Department had run out of leads, suspects, and the resources necessary to continue the investigation. Over the next 10 years, 
Terry's family suffered. George Brooks' hair turned white, his cheeks lost their fullness, and his smile, so like his daughter Terry's, rarely appeared on his face. George had bought Scott a new suit to wear to Terry's funeral, which was held on February 8, 1984, when there was still so many leads in the investigation into Terry's murder that police were practically working around the clock. But after that service, as the investigation stalled, the Brooks family lost touch with Scott. And a decade later, Scott would eventually marry and go on to have a child. With Terry's three siblings to take care of, George and Elizabeth Brooks also did their best to move forward. But they never stopped checking in with investigators to see if there was any new information about their daughter's murder. Finally, in 1990, the Brooks hired a lawyer to file a wrongful death lawsuit against the Marriott Corporation. This kind of lawsuit seeks compensation for the emotional loss of a victim's family or survivors, like lost companionship. And these kinds of lawsuits are also very hard to win. But for the Brooks, the purpose of this lawsuit was not to get money. It was to get investigators for both sides to do their own digging into Terry's murder to see if the wrongful death claim had any legal merit. In 1990, investigators for the Brooks attorney handed their report over to local law enforcement. And at some point, that report was added to the stack of documents marked Terry Brooks that sat gathering dust in the Township Falls Police Storage Unit. But on May 22, 1998, 14 years after Terry's body had been discovered on the floor in the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers restaurant, the investigation into her murder was back in the media spotlight. The day before, on the third Thursday of the month, 82 well-dressed men and women could all be seen climbing the stone steps of a large Victorian brownstone located in the heart of downtown Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Each person entering the Old City Tavern wore a distinctive red, white, and blue rosette pinned to their chest, and each one was a member of a very select group of crime investigators who were well-known in law enforcement circles, but unknown to the general public. This was a regular meeting of the V-Duck Society, a unique crime-fighting organization co-founded eight years earlier by three nationally recognized forensic investigators. Named after Eugene V-Duck, a French detective who is considered the father of modern crime investigation, its members select and review cold cases brought to them by law enforcement agencies, offering fresh perspectives that might help kickstart a stalled investigation. On the agenda for that cool and cloudy Thursday afternoon was a one-hour slideshow by Falls Township Police Sergeant Wynn Cloud that would present all the evidence police had gathered during their failed 1984 investigation into the death of 25-year-old Terry Brooks. Sergeant Cloud had recently been promoted by the township's new police chief to head up the department's detective division. At the same time, Chief Arnie Connelline had also ordered Sergeant Cloud to start reviewing cold cases. And the first case on that list was Terry Brooks. So, after the VDUC Society members, one for every 82 years of Eugene VDUC's life, had finished their formal lunch and were waiting for dessert, a very nervous Detective Cloud stepped up to the podium at the front of the grand dining room, a slide projector on the table next to him, and a large silver projection screen behind him. And over the next 60 minutes, VDUC Society investigators saw images of the 90 pieces of physical evidence and pictures that had been collected from the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers where Terry had been killed. The slides included fingerprints, Terry's bloodied purple jacket, the butcher knife sticking out of her throat, the contents of her purse scattered across the floor around her, the defensive wounds on Terry's hands and arms, the drive through window where the murderer had fled the scene of the crime, and a picture of the blood and tissue, assumed to be that of her attacker, that had been scraped from underneath Terry's fingernails. Back in 1984, when Terry was killed, an examination of that blood and tissue would not have revealed the identity of the killer. But since then, a lot had changed in forensic science. And now, in 1998, if police could find a suspect whose DNA profile matched a DNA analysis of those samples, police would have the breakthrough on this case that they needed. But first, they needed to find that suspect. 
When the presentation was over, members of the VDUC Society had harsh words for the original team that investigated Terry's murder. It wasn't that the detectives back in 1984 weren't working night and day to solve a case that had produced enough statements to fill three large cardboard boxes. The problem, according to forensic psychologist Richard Walter, was that investigators had misinterpreted the crime scene. Instead of focusing on the robbery angle, right from the start, detectives should have been focusing on the extreme violence of the murder itself. Putting down his fork and pushing aside his plate of thick crusted apple pie, one of the three founders of the VDUC Society went on to tell Sergeant Cloud that even though the case was 14 years old, the murder itself had already revealed a great deal of information about the killer. But police would need to begin the whole investigation over from scratch, starting with a DNA analysis of the tissue sample collected from under Terry's fingernails. And then Dr. Walters told police the two key questions that would lead them to discover the identity of Terry's murderer. Over the next four months, 32-year-old Falls Township detective Nelson Whitney took the lead on the new investigation into the Terry Brooks homicide, ordering a complete DNA analysis of blood, hair, and tissue samples found at the crime scene. Then, with the help of the VDUC Society and a profile of the killer developed by Richard Walter, investigators re-interviewed Terry's parents, former co-workers, and friends of Terry who had not been interviewed during the first investigation. Investigators also combed through the funeral register that listed the names of people who had attended Terry's memorial service back on February 8, 1984, trying to track down the phone numbers and addresses of possible witnesses or suspects. And then, buried in the old files, Detective Whitney discovered the report that had been done eight years earlier by the investigators who had been hired to look into the wrongful death lawsuit Terry's parents had filed back in 1990. That report, along with an interview with Terry's friend, Sidney Bradney, the bartender at Coochie's Restaurant, where Terry and she had worked before Terry took the job at Roy Rogers, eventually led investigators to the suspect they'd been looking for. The challenge now was how to link this person to the crime and get a written confession. One month later, early one morning in October of 1998, Detective Nelson sat in an unmarked police car staking out a modest home that had become as familiar to him as his own house. It was trash day, and Detective Whitney had already seen the residents of this particular house put their bag of trash out at the curb. The detective also knew that the moment they dropped it there by the street, whatever was inside that bag was no longer considered their own private property. Instead, anyone who wanted to rummage around in that trash or take something out of the trash and keep it was legally free to do so. The investigator tensed when he heard the rumble of the garbage collection truck coming down the road behind him. Watching the truck in his rearview mirror, the young detective put his hand on the inside handle of the driver's side car door. And as soon as the garbage truck slowed to a stop and one of the workers hopped down and picked up that bag of trash in front of the house that Detective Whitney had been watching, the detective was out of his car and across the street. By prior arrangement with the garbage collection company, the detective took the bag directly from the gloved hand of the sanitation worker, carried it back to his car, tossed it into the trunk, jumped inside the car, and drove off to the Falls Township Police Station. With any luck, that bag of trash would contain a DNA sample from their suspect that would line up with the DNA of the tissue collected 14 years earlier from Terry's dead body. And sure enough, a smear of saliva scraped off the butt of one of the discarded cigarettes inside that trash bag would turn out to be a solid match. And on the evening of February 4, 1998, on the 14th anniversary of Terry's murder, police knocked on the door of the house where the suspect lived. Based on the new information police had learned from Terry's friend, Cindy, coupled with the information the police would learn directly from the suspect over the course of the next six hours, here is a reconstruction of what happened to Terry Brooks in the early morning hours of that Saturday 14 years ago in the minutes just before she left work at her Roy Rogers restaurant in Fairless Hills. <laughs> 
As Terry drove to work on the evening of Friday, February 3rd, 1984, she thought about her conversation the week before with her good friend, Cindy. At the time they had talked, Terry had been so distressed that she practically broke down in tears. But now, a few days later, while Terry still felt upset, she also felt like she knew what she had to do to make things right. It wouldn't be easy, but as Terry was learning very quickly, she just needed to accept that other people were not always going to agree with or welcome every decision she made. By the time Terry had pulled into the parking lot of the Fairless Hills Roy Rogers, she told herself it was time to stop worrying and turn her attention instead to the work shift ahead of her. A few minutes later, and Terry was stepping out of the foggy darkness into the brightly lit and cheerful interior of the restaurant. And after that, Terry didn't have time to worry even if she wanted to, because the next eight hours flew by. First in a rush of food orders and the clatter of plates and silverware, and then after the restaurant closed to the public, in the bustle of staff cleaning up and getting ready to leave for the night. By the time Terry had locked the glass doors behind the two-person cleaning crew that left at 1.30 a.m., she had almost finished with her paperwork. And a half hour after that, and Terry was more than ready to go home. It had been a long day and night, and she was looking forward to sleeping late that morning. Pulling on her short winter jacket and reaching for her brown purse, Terry glanced around the office to make sure everything was in its place for the next day. But just when Terry was about to turn out the office light and leave, she stopped, sure that she had just heard a knock on the front door of the restaurant. Slipping her purse over her shoulder and gripping her set of keys in her free hand, Terry stepped through the kitchen prep area so she could peek out into the parking lot. Recognizing the person standing outside, Terry relaxed, but only slightly. Letting out a deep breath, she walked forward to open the doors for her unexpected visitor. Half an hour earlier, when the two-person cleaning crew had left Roy Rogers, Terry's killer had already been watching the restaurant from the parking lot next door for 30 minutes. Even without the car engine and heater running, the night was so unseasonably warm that inside of the car was still comfortable. Not that the killer would have noticed anyway. There were more important things to think about, like how Terry deserved everything that she had coming to her. Seeing her lock the door behind the two teenagers and disappear back into the dimly lit kitchen area, the killer reached over to the pack of Newports lying on the passenger seat. There was just enough time for one more cigarette. At 2 a.m., the killer had left their vehicle and was knocking on the front door of Roy Rogers. A few minutes later, the killer had followed Terry towards the back of the restaurant until they were both standing on the red tiled floor just outside of the kitchen. Only now, the two of them weren't just talking, they were arguing. And this time, Terry was not backing down. And in response to what Terry had to say, Terry's killer suddenly stepped forward and hit Terry in the face. The blow was so hard, it literally lifted Terry out of her moccasin-style shoes and sent her flying. She landed flat on her back, her keys and the contents of her purse skittering off in every direction. And that was just the beginning. Once Terry was on the floor, her attacker straddled her body and began choking her and pounding her head against the floor. Then the killer reached up to grab a seven inch long butcher knife from one of the tables above them. The autopsy report later showed that Terry would suffer not one, but several fatal injuries. In addition to brain hemorrhage, a broken bone in her throat and a crushed voice box, Terry would be stabbed 20 times in the face, neck, and torso, as well as beaten with a length of lead pipe. But even as she was dying, Terry fought back. After her attacker had stabbed the knife once through her neck, Terry threw her hands and arms up to protect herself, and in doing that, her fingernails dragged along the surface of the attacker's skin. It wasn't until the second knife strike severed Terry's spinal cord and left her paralyzed that she finally lay still, her arms falling outstretched to either side of her body. The tip of the knife had dug so deeply into the floor that Terry's throat was pinned to the hard red tiles. Unable to scream or move, Terry stared up into the face of her killer. Still, it wasn't over. Breathing heavily with excitement, 
Terry's killer got up off the floor and, stepping to the nearby trash can, pulled out the clear plastic bag that lined the bin. Returning to where Terry lay trapped, her killer bent down and wrapped the bag around her head, and then watched as Terry's final breaths created a film of condensation inside the suffocating layers of plastic. A minute later, the killer had turned away, cracked open the door of the safe, and gathered up all the bills inside. Then, with a last look around, the killer pushed open the drive through window, climbed over the sill, and dropped down onto the pavement below, before running at a crouch back to the adjacent parking lot. There was the sound of a car engine starting, and then the killer was turning out onto Route 1 to head home. Fourteen years later, these two questions that forensic psychologist Richard Walter asked at the May 21st meeting of the V-Duck Society would in fact lead police straight to Terry's killer. The first question was, who would Terry trust and know well enough to let into the restaurant at 2 a.m. the morning she died? And the second question was, who had such intense feelings for Terry that their attack would have been brutal enough to kill her several times over? There was only one answer. Terry's devoted fiancé, Albert Scott Keefe. It would turn out that when police reopened the investigation into Terry's death, Terry's friend, Cindy Bradney, would tell investigators that just the week before Terry was killed, Terry had confided that she was thinking of calling off her July 14th wedding. Eight months into her engagement, Terry had begun to have serious second thoughts about spending her life with Scott. It turned out he had a bad temper, and he was jealous and very possessive of Terry. Terry had begun to feel that the real reason he came to sit with her at Roy Rogers while she closed the restaurant had less to do with concern over her safety and more to do with ungrounded suspicions that she might be seeing other people. Scott also had money problems, and so he was angry when Terry left Coochie's restaurant, where they both worked, for a lower-paying job at Roy Rogers. When Terry had walked into the Doylestown Travel Agency with Scott three days before she was killed and paid for the couple's honeymoon, Terry may have realized that the time had come to end her engagement or delay the wedding before it was too late. And according to Dr. Walter and other VDUC Society members who would later review the investigation into Terry's murder, the safe at Roy Rogers may have been robbed, but the real motive for Terry's death had never been money. Instead, this had been a complex and personal murder committed by someone driven by both anger and retaliation. Someone who would rather kill Terry many times over than allow her to walk away from their relationship. Everything else about the crime, the robbery, jumping out of the drive through window, Scott appearing later that morning at the Brooks' house full of concern over not seeing Terry's car in the driveway, all of that had been pure misdirection. But now, 14 years later, on February 4th, 1998, armed with the DNA from one of Scott's discarded Newport cigarette butts that was tied to the hair and tissue found at the crime scene, investigators finally had the physical evidence they needed to bring Scott into the police station for questioning. By then, Scott and his wife were divorced, and Scott's life seemed to have come full circle. He was once again living with his mother in Warminster and working at an Italian pizzeria the next town over. Confronted with the new DNA evidence, new witness statements that described serious tensions in Scott's relationship with Terry, and the fact that he had failed a lie detector test, in the early hours of February 5th, 1998, Scott confessed to the murder of Terry Brooks. In a final twist to a case that had now captured national attention, Police also revealed that the report filed by investigators looking into the wrongful death lawsuit the Brooks had filed back in 1990 had also listed Scott Keefe as the most likely person to have murdered Terry. The report also included the witness statement that placed Scott in the parking lot adjacent to Roy Rogers about an hour before Terry was killed. Almost two years later, on Monday, June 5th, 2000, 37-year-old Scott Keefe was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without parole. Terry's father, George Brooks, died before Scott's trial, succumbing to a long illness just 15 months after he was informed that Scott had been arrested for killing his daughter. 
In February of 2000, four months before Scott's trial, Terry's family won its wrongful death lawsuit against Marriott Corporation. The $675,000 settlement was divided between attorneys and Terry's estate. Before we get started, I just want to give a special shout out to Billy Jensen, who is a fantastic true crime investigative journalist who wrote the article for LA Magazine called The Secret Life of Johnny Lewis. That article was used extensively in the making of this podcast. So thank you, Billy. Johnny Lewis was only seven years old when he landed his first acting role. Granted, it was only a bit part in an obscure escalator safety video, but it was a start. From there, Johnny appeared in dozens of commercials, including with Pizza Hut, before someone recognized this kid has real talent, and he earned appearances on the hit TV shows Seventh Heaven, Malcolm in the Middle, and Drake and Josh, which were really big in the late 90s and early 2000s. In 2001, when Johnny was 18 years old, he had made enough money from acting that he was able to leave his parents' home in North Los Angeles and move into a new home right in Hollywood with a bunch of other up-and-coming actors and actresses. By 2006, when Johnny was 23 years old, he was riding high. He had landed several more big TV roles, like a recurring role in the show The O.C., which was very popular in the 2000s. And in 2006, he was dating the mega pop star Katy Perry. And although their romance was relatively short, apparently it was very intense because Katy would go on to write two songs that were apparently about Johnny. But Johnny's real rise to stardom occurred two years later in 2008 when he was cast as the character Half Sack on the critically acclaimed motorcycle drama Sons of Anarchy. While the show made him famous and fabulously wealthy, Johnny was growing concerned with the direction the show was taking. He felt like it was becoming too violent. Johnny liked reading poetry and studying philosophy and staying up late drinking tea and playing chess. He did not like acting out scenes of gratuitous violence. It just wasn't who he was. So after being on the show for two seasons very successfully, he was a very popular character. He went to the writers and said, you gotta write me out of the script. I can't do this anymore. The writers were totally caught off guard and begged him to stay, but he had made up his mind. And so in 2009, his character was killed off. After leaving Sons of Anarchy, Johnny decided that he wasn't going to pursue any serious acting roles for the time being. Instead, he wanted to focus his time on writing his first novel, which was about this musical genius trying to make his way in the world. And so he started asking around to see if anybody he knew knew of a quiet place he could live and write out of. And his photographer said, I think I know the place. It was called the Writer's Villa, and it was this beautiful house with six bedrooms for rent right outside of Hollywood. Over the years, it had become a sort of safe haven for up and coming actors and actresses still looking to land their big break. The reason it developed this reputation was because of the owner, Kathy Davis. She was this wonderful woman who really understood how difficult trying to break into Hollywood was for all these people that stayed at her house. And so she would look after them and make them food and offer them rides. And she would stay up late and listen to their frustrations and be a shoulder to cry on if they didn't get the part they wanted. Many of her tenants, who went on to be big Hollywood stars, would later attribute their success, at least in part, to the time they spent with Kathy at the villa, which they remembered as being therapeutic and soothing. Even though Johnny had already had his big break in The Sons of Anarchy, he loved the idea of living in such a peaceful place that seemed to cater to eccentric artists like himself. So in April of 2009, Johnny called Kathy and requested a room, and she said, absolutely, you can stay on the second floor in the Red Suite. After moving in, Johnny would tell his friends that the writer's villa was just as amazing as he thought it was going to be. And Kathy specifically was just as wonderful as everyone said she was. He actually struck up a friendship with her almost immediately. Everything seemed to be going really well for Johnny in his life until a few months later, he found out his girlfriend, Diane, was pregnant. Although this totally screwed up his plans for his novel, Johnny was really excited about being a father, and so he decided to move out of the villa and in with Diane, who lived nearby, to help take care of their child. Nine months later, on April 6th, 2010, Diane gave birth to a healthy little girl named Kala May, and Johnny and Diane fell madly in love with her. But unfortunately, Johnny and Diane's love for each other faded quickly after becoming parents, and before long, Johnny had moved out and back in with his parents. Not long after that, Johnny and Diane became embroiled in this really vicious, long custody battle over Kalame, which ultimately Johnny lost, which was devastating for him. 
A few months later, in October of 2011, when Johnny was still living with his parents, he decided to take his motorcycle out and just go ride around and clear his head. And so he drove for about two hours to the west of LA out into the desert where he lost control of his bike and he crashed. After getting to the hospital, his injuries were determined to be relatively minor, except they were concerned he might have a head injury. However, after testing negative for a concussion, he was said to be okay by doctors and he was sent home. But when he got home from the hospital, he was not okay. He was a totally different person. Johnny's father, Michael, immediately noticed the change in his son's behavior. He just started acting really weird and erratic, and his thoughts weren't always coherent, and he was really agitated all the time. It was just very obvious that something was off. And it made Michael wonder, perhaps my son did get a head injury from that motorcycle accident, and the doctors just missed it. And so Michael scheduled two separate MRIs for Johnny to go to, but for whatever reason, Johnny refused to go. Around this time, Johnny's friends began to notice his strange behavior when in December of that year, he was at an acting class and he began speaking in a vaguely British accent. And everybody in the class noticed it. And eventually someone said, hey, you know, why are you doing that? And Johnny was like, what? And just kind of shrugged it off and acted like he wasn't doing that. A few weeks later, on the morning of January 3rd, 2012, Johnny was at his parents' house and he was sitting in the kitchen while his mom was making omelets. And Johnny just kind of abruptly says, I'm going to go out for a walk. So he gets up, he's only got his pajamas on, no shoes on. He walks out the door and as he's walking down the road, he gets maybe 10 or 15 feet away from his parents' house when he hears someone screaming, like they're screaming in distress. And he thinks it's coming from the apartment that was right next to his parents' house. And so he breaks into the apartment, but there's no one in the apartment. It's totally vacant. And so as he's in this apartment wondering what's going on, the two men that owned the apartment, they came home and they see Johnny standing there and they told him he had to leave immediately. And instead of leaving immediately, Johnny grabbed a nearby glass bottle and he charged at them and hit them both over the head with the bottle before they managed to restrain him and hold him down until the police showed up. Johnny claimed he was acting in self-defense, but the police didn't believe him. And so they charged him with trespassing, burglary, and assault with a deadly weapon, and they sent him to jail. When Johnny's father was finally able to come to the jail and bail his son out, it had been eight days, and in those eight days, Johnny had been moved from general population to a psych ward because he was banging his head against the inside of his cell, and at one point he had tried to jump off of a balcony, and he was just generally acting unhinged. And so when he was discharged, on his paperwork, a doctor at the jail had commented that he thought Johnny at one point must have had some sort of head injury that had made him act this way, and he was definitely suicidal. When Johnny got back to his parents' house, he was an absolute wreck. Physically, I mean, he had two black eyes and his face was all puffed up from the confrontation he had with those two men in the apartment. And emotionally, he was so distraught that he wouldn't let anyone in his family come near him. He just holed up in his room and just told everyone to stay away. He also became extremely sensitive to light, to the point where he was turning off all the lights in his parents' home, and then when they would eventually just turn them back on again, he would get agitated and turn them all off, and then finally he just disabled his parents' fuse box. But despite Johnny's obvious issues after coming home from jail, over the next few weeks, he did actually seem to be improving to the point where at the end of January, so about a month after he came home from jail, his parents allowed him to move out and go live on his own in Santa Monica, California, about 30 minutes away. But as soon as he was living on his own, his trouble started again. On February 10th, so about a week after moving into this place in Santa Monica, he was arrested for punching some random stranger in the head outside of a yogurt shop but he was ultimately released on $20,000 bail. A couple of days later, Johnny, fully clothed, just walked into the ocean, and when he was pulled out, he had to be brought to the hospital to be treated for hypothermia. A couple of days after getting out of the hospital, he was arrested again, this time for trying to break into a woman's apartment in Santa Monica. He claimed he thought it was his friend's apartment, but nobody believed him, so he was brought to jail and then released on bail again. After the second arrest in Santa Monica, Johnny's parents finally convinced him to go see a doctor about this potential head injury they thought he got from that 2011 motorcycle crash. Even though that jailhouse doc had suggested Johnny had a head injury, he had not officially diagnosed him. So Johnny needed another doctor to officially diagnose his head injury so they could begin to treat it. But the doctor Johnny wound up seeing did not suspect a head injury. Instead, he suspected schizophrenia or bipolar, which are two very serious mental disorders. And so he prescribed some medication to Johnny that would treat both of those disorders, and Johnny was on his way. Johnny refused to take the medication and refused to go see another doctor, and so his condition just continued to get worse. 
Johnny was still facing serious jail time for the break-in and assault against those two men in the apartment next to his parents' home. And so Johnny's lawyer was trying to get a deal done where Johnny would go to a mental health treatment facility for a year instead of going to jail for a year. But Johnny was so confident these charges would just get dropped and he'd be allowed to go back to his life and live the way he wanted to that he fired his lawyer and he represented himself in court. But the charges were not dropped and he was sentenced to one year in prison. However, the jail he was sent to was so overcrowded, they reduced his sentence all the way down to only six weeks. When Johnny's father finally came to pick him up from prison on Friday, September 21st, 2012, Johnny was at an all-time low. Even though he'd only been in jail for six weeks instead of the year he was supposed to be there, it was clear that amount of time had done an enormous amount of damage to him. And so on the car ride home from prison, Johnny just kind of sheepishly asked his father, you know, hey dad, would it be possible if you called Kathy Davis at the writer's villa and just see if there's any way I can move back in? And Michael's thinking to himself, you know, I hadn't thought of that, but the writer's villa was the last place Johnny was when his life was still in order. It was probably the last place he was happy, and so he probably has attached a lot of fond memories to that place, and so that's a great place for him to go. And so as soon as they got home, Michael called Kathy Davis and explained the situation and said, you know, is there any way he can stay there? And she said, absolutely, the red suite is still available. I'll go up and make the bed right now. I can't wait to see him. Johnny stayed with his parents that weekend. And then on Monday, September 24th, he packed up his stuff and he moved back into the villa. Two days later, a 70-year-old man named Dan Blackburn, who was actually neighbors to the Writers Villa property, he was looking out his front window at this man who was standing out in the road. He only had on jeans and red shoes. He had no shirt on and he was very sweaty. And he was just kind of frantically pacing around the road. And he had never seen this guy before. And so he was just kind of poking out behind his curtain, watching him to see what he's going to do next. And after about 15 minutes of this kind of strange pacing in the road, this guy turns and walks directly towards Dan's property, goes right up to the front step and starts knocking on the door. Dan was definitely a little bit concerned, but he shut the curtain, he walked over to the door, and he looks out the people, and there's this guy standing there with bright blue eyes that are all wide, and he's looking at the people as if he can see through and see Dan, but he can't. And so Dan reaches down and he opens the door just a little bit and he looks out and the guy outside looks at him and goes, hi, I'm John, I'm your new neighbor. It would turn out John was Johnny Lewis. And so Dan opened the door a little bit farther and he looks at him and he goes, hi, John, nice to meet you. And before the two men could have any sort of conversation, Johnny just abruptly turned around and walked away. And so Dan is totally puzzled by this strange interaction he's just had with Johnny Lewis. And he's watching him as he just walks back to the road, he walks back over and goes inside the villa and disappears. And so Dan kind of shrugs it off, he shuts his door, locks it, and goes back to his morning routine. About 30 minutes later, Dan is doing his own thing in his house when he hears his wife outside screaming for him to come outside. And so Dan runs out the front door, he goes into his driveway, which is between his property and the writer's villa, and he sees his wife is standing in the driveway, horrified, pointing up towards the back of their house. He looks down, and back near their back deck, Johnny, Johnny Lewis, is standing on top of the guy that Dan and his wife had hired that day to paint their back deck. Johnny is just raining blows down on this guy. He's got a piece of wood too that he's hitting him with. And the worker is sitting there trying to shield himself. There's blood all over him. And Dan instinctively just runs over to Johnny. Johnny's not seen Dan at this point. Dan gets right up to him and he grabs him by the shoulder and he tries pulling Johnny off. He's screaming at Johnny to stop, but Johnny just seems totally unfazed. He's just destroying this worker. And so finally, after Dan yanks on Johnny hard enough, Johnny jumps up, turns around and levels Dan square in the face. Dan falls to the ground and when he looks up, Johnny is just standing over him, looking at him with no expression on his face. It's like he didn't know what he was going to do with Dan next. So he just stood there and stared at him. But Dan wasn't going to waste any time. He jumped up and he clocked Johnny square in the side of the head, but it had no effect on Johnny. He still just stared at Dan completely expressionless. And so Dan grabbed a nearby lawn chair and practically broke it over the head of Johnny. But again, it had no effect on Johnny. He just stood there completely expressionless, staring at Dan. And so at this point, Dan just grabs the worker who can barely stand and he runs back down the driveway. He grabs his wife and they run towards the house to go inside. And the three of them manage to get inside the house. And as they're shutting the big heavy door, Johnny comes bounding up and he gets right in front and he jams his arm in the space between the door and the wall. So they can't close the door because it's getting stuck on his arm. 
And so all three of the adults inside, Dan, his wife, and the painter, are putting all of their weight on this huge wooden door onto Johnny's arm, and Johnny is just trying to grab them the whole time. And so finally, the three of them start raising the door and slamming it as hard as they can on Johnny's arm. And finally, after several hard blows to his arm, Johnny retracted his arm, and they were able to shut the door and lock it. And so at this point, Dan's wife and the painter ran around the house, closing every window, locking every door. Meanwhile, Dan went to the side window that looked out towards the Writers Villa property, and he got his phone out and he called 911 as he's looking out the door, looking for Johnny. And so after he tells 911 what's going on and he hangs up, Johnny suddenly just appears running down his driveway as if he's running back towards the back deck but he stops almost right in front of Dan's window. He turns and he starts running towards the villa property. He jumps over a fence that's at least waist height, just jumps clear over it. And then he gets to this huge wooden fence that surrounded the entire villa property that was at least, you know, eight, nine, 10 feet. And he very easily just jumps, grabs the top and catapults himself right over the top and then disappeared inside of the villa. Within minutes, the police showed up and they went inside the villa and they could not believe what they found. Based on the evidence, this is what investigators believe happened. After Johnny, for the first time, walked up to Dan's property and awkwardly knocked on the door and said, Hi, I'm John. I'm your new neighbor. After that, he turned around and Dan watched him as he left his property and made his way back and went inside the villa. Once Johnny got inside the villa, he made his way up to the second floor and he went into Kathy Davis's room where she was sitting. Now, Kathy most likely turned and saw Johnny standing in the doorway. He's got no shirt on. He's sweating. He looks totally crazed. She probably was not scared. Instead, her motherly instincts kicked in and she probably said, hey, are you okay? Can I help you? What's going on? And as she probably stood up and made her way over to make sure he was okay, Johnny, for reasons no one understands, proceeded to beat and kick and strangle her. And then when she fell to the ground and was totally helpless, Johnny proceeded to either stomp on her skull repeatedly or he hit her over the head repeatedly with a rusty hammer that was later found in his bedroom. But no matter how Johnny did it, he managed to severely fracture her skull, and that's what ultimately killed her. After killing Kathy, Johnny tracked down her beloved cat and killed the cat the same way. Afterwards, Johnny ran out of the villa, and that's when he spotted Dan's house painter just sitting outside, and he walked over to him and just began beating him. And just like the attack on Kathy and her cat, this attack on this house painter appeared to have no motive as well. After Dan came outside and managed to fight Johnny off, and then when Dan went back inside the house with his wife and with the painter, Johnny stood outside for a few minutes before running down Dan's driveway and then hopping over those two fences right in front of Dan, and then Johnny disappeared inside of the villa. Once Johnny was in the villa, it's believed he climbed up to the upper patio or onto the roof of the villa itself, and from there he either jumped or fell to his death on the driveway below. His death was officially ruled an accident, not a suicide. After the news broke about what had happened at the writer's villa, everybody assumed Johnny must have been on some really hardcore drugs. That's the only explanation for why someone would act the way he acted. But when his toxicology report came back, it showed he had absolutely no drugs of any kind, legal or illegal, in his system. He was completely sober at the time he committed this horrible crime. Some believe Johnny really did have some undiagnosed head injury from that motorcycle accident, and this head injury is responsible for his violent outbursts. Others disagree and say the head injury had nothing to do with it. Johnny clearly had some undiagnosed mental disorder. Maybe it was schizophrenia, maybe he was bipolar, maybe it was something else, but it was this mental disorder that led to these violent outbursts. But to this day, no one knows for sure why Johnny did what he did. All we know is an innocent woman and her cat were needlessly killed. The next and final story of today's episode is called This Demon Still Lives Among Us. In early 1974, 31-year-old Michael Taylor was living happily with his wife Christine and their five children in Osset, which is a small town in central England. 
Michael was described as a great father and a great husband who had an excellent sense of humor. In fact, neighbors, whenever they would walk past the Taylor household, would say you could often hear the sound of Michael laughing or the sound of him telling jokes to his family. But in April of that year, everything changed for the Taylor family. Michael had been doing some home repairs when he fell off of a ladder and he hurt his back. The injury itself was fairly minor, but it resulted in chronic pain, and this chronic pain quickly changed how Michael behaved. Michael went from being this cheerful, funny, happy guy to being sad and depressed, and he was so irritable that his family could barely be around him because he would lash out at them. Now, the Taylor family was not a religious family, however, most families who lived in Osset at that time were. And so when one of Michael's friends found out about how poorly Michael was doing, they approached Michael and said, you know, you really ought to turn to religion for help and for guidance in this difficult time. And they also told him specifically that he really ought to check out this one particular Christian group. It was called the Christian Fellowship Group. And all it was was a prayer group for Christians who wanted more religious support beyond just going to church on Sundays. But this friend of Michael's told him that the real draw of this group was the group's leader. Her name was Marie Robinson, and she was this 21-year-old, extremely friendly and energetic and charismatic person who just had this incredible way of making all of her members really feel like they belonged. And so Michael's friend was telling him that he really thought Marie could be the difference maker for him, that she could help him get back to normal. And so Michael, you know, he trusted this friend and he really didn't have much to lose at this point. He was already at rock bottom. And so he agrees to go check this group out. So on September 12th of that year, Michael makes his way to the church where this fellowship group is held. He goes inside and he makes his way to one of the back rooms in the church. And when he goes inside, he sees there's a ring of people sitting in a circle, about 20 people. And as soon as they see Michael coming in the room, they all stand up and they open their arms up. And they say, come on, come sit down with us. Welcome, welcome to the group. And then the woman who had to be Marie, she stands up and she looks at Michael, huge smile on her face, and she encourages him to come over and sit right next to me. Welcome, we'd love to have you join our group. And so Michael, for the first time in ages, is smiling as he strides across the room and sits down right next to Marie. And then as Marie began to lead the group in prayer, Michael did not feel his chronic pain. He just felt happy again. But when the meeting was over and Michael went back home again, the pain and depression came flooding back. It was like the only place he could be happy was inside of the church at this fellowship group. And so over the next couple of weeks, Michael completely prioritized this group. He went to all of their meetings. And over the course of these couple of weeks, Michael became very close with Marie. And apparently Marie became very close with Michael to the point where the two of them would stay after, after the meetings were over. And just those two would sequester themselves in quiet prayer. No one knew what they did in there, but it just seemed like they were developing a real relationship. And in fact, many people in this group suspected they were having an affair. And before long, the rumors in the church had spread outside and were all over Osset. And then before long, Christine, Michael's wife, was hearing from a friend or a neighbor that apparently Michael was having an affair with Marie. Now, Christine had already suspected her husband was having an affair with Marie because Marie was the only thing Michael talked about when he got home. So on October 1st of that year, only a couple of weeks after Michael had first attended this group, Christine waited until Michael had left the house to head out to one of the group meetings. And then Christine hopped in her car and she followed him to the church. And when she got there, she parked her car, she took a deep breath, and then she got out. She made her way to the front doors of the church and she stormed inside and she found the room where these meetings were held. She barges in and she points at her husband and she says, I know you're having an affair with Marie. Then you're gonna admit it in front of this whole group. And Michael, who's sitting with his back to his wife in one of the chairs, he stands up and instead of addressing his wife, who's accused him of infidelity, he turns and looks at Marie on the other side of the room. And when Marie made eye contact with Michael, she screamed. She would later say, Michael did not look human. He looked like a beast and he had wild eyes. And so as Michael is standing there staring at Marie with this very aggressive face, he began breaking out in tongues. Speaking in tongues is where the speaker will be saying or uttering words or sounds that sound like language, but the speaker doesn't know what they mean. The idea is some entity has come inside of their body and this entity is dictating their speech. 
And so Michael is broken out in tongues. He's barking these words and sounds at Marie. And everyone inside of the room has no idea what to make of this. Everything has happened so suddenly and it's so surprising. You have the wife suddenly coming in and aggressively accusing her husband of cheating. And Michael is not responding to it and he's acting totally crazy. And then before anyone can do anything, Michael goes from just barking in strange languages at Marie to suddenly rushing across the room as if he's going to attack her. And when he does that, the rest of the members jump on top of him and hold him down. And despite there being like 10 or 15 people holding him down, Michael is still trying to get up and he's screaming and snarling and yelling at Marie. And then Marie suddenly breaks out into tongues too. And it's only then that Michael stops trying to force himself up out of this pig pile that's on top of him. And instead, he just continues to speak in tongues to her. And so the two of them are looking at each other, speaking in tongues, and the rest of the group is just totally dumbfounded. And so they just begin praying. And then after about an hour, Michael just collapses. It's like he went unconscious. And at that point, everybody in the room just goes silent and they look at Michael. And then Michael kind of opens his eyes and it's almost like he's waking up and he begins looking around frantically trying to figure out what had just happened. Michael would claim he had no memory of what had just happened to him. And so at this point, Marie would tell him and Christine that she believed Michael was possessed by a demonic force. And the only thing they could do at this point would be to perform an exorcism. An exorcism is an expulsion or attempted expulsion of a supposedly evil spirit inside of a person or a place. Michael and Christine were at a loss. They had no idea what to do in this situation. They were both kind of in shock for very different reasons. And so they just kind of deferred to Marie's judgment and said, yeah, you know, I think an exorcism is the way to go. So Christine and Michael just leave the church and go home. And then the next morning, Marie would get in touch with the Anglican Church of England and would request an exorcism. And after hearing about what was going on with Michael, the Anglican Church would say, yeah, that does sound like he needs an exorcism. And so the following day, they would send out two of their best exorcists named Peter and Raymond. And so Peter and Raymond, they get to Osset, they go to Michael's house and they observe him. And very quickly, they determine that it does seem like Michael is possessed by at least one demonic force. And so they tell Michael, the only thing we can do here is perform this exorcism, but we need you to agree to it. And so Michael says, okay, yeah, I agree to this exorcism. And so would his wife, because she at this point is just completely unsure what to do. She's just going along for the ride. So a day later on October 4th at 10 p.m., Michael, his wife, and the rest of the members of this fellowship group, along with Peter and Raymond, they would all meet at this other church in a neighboring town. And as soon as Michael had been positioned in the middle of this group in this chair, Peter and Raymond began the ritual by praying. And as soon as they did, Michael began screaming out in tongues and he began writhing around and he fell to the ground and he began contorting his body in grotesque positions as if the words Peter and Raymond were saying were physically harming Michael. And so after eight hours of this, during which they had to actually tie Michael down to prevent him from hurting other members or hurting himself, after eight hours, they finally just came to a stop. Peter and Raymond were exhausted. It looked very much like Michael too was exhausted. And as soon as they stopped the ritual, Michael just kind of collapsed on the ground as if he had fallen unconscious. And then at some point he kind of wakes up and he's looking around wildly. He's still tied down to the ground and he's acting like he has no idea what's just happened. And at this point, Peter and Raymond, they tell him that, you know, the exorcism was mostly successful. We identified 40 demons inside of you. And this exorcism was able to expel 37 of them. So that means there's still three demons inside of you. Now, we can't do it right now. We're too tired. You're too exhausted. So go home, get some rest. And tomorrow we will finish this exorcism. We will get rid of those three demons and you will be just fine. And so Michael and Christine, they get their things and they leave the church and they head home. A few hours later, around noon, a woman who lived near where Michael Taylor and his family lived thought she heard something strange outside of her house. It sounded like someone yelling. And so she went to the front of the house and she pulled the curtain aside on one of her windows and outside walking down the street completely naked, covered in blood, was Michael Taylor. And he was saying something about Satan. 
And so this woman, she calls the police, the police show up and they find Michael. He had curled up on the sidewalk outside of this woman's house and he was giggling like a child in the fetal position. And so the police approach him and at some point Michael apparently snaps out of it and he starts looking up at the police like he has no idea what's going on. And eventually they would get him to tell them his name and where he lived. And so after calling in backup to deal with Michael, the responding officers made their way to Michael's residence. And so they go inside and immediately, as soon as they see what's in there, one of the officers just turns around and runs outside and begins dry heaving. The inside of the Taylor family home would become one of the most infamous crime scenes in English history. A few hours earlier, when Michael and his wife had come home from the exorcism, they had gone inside and then Michael had fallen into one of his trances and began beating his wife. And then at some point she fell to the ground and either was dead or was in the process of dying, at which point Michael jumped on top of her and using only his hands, he ripped her face off and flung it across the room. And then as she's laying there bleeding to death, he began rubbing her blood all over his body. And then after she had finally died, he tracked down the family dog and killed the dog as well. Fortunately, their five children were not home at the time of this attack, and so they were unharmed. During Michael's trial, the prosecution and the defense blamed the Anglican Church of England and Marie and her religious group for effectively convincing Michael he was possessed with demons, which caused him to act out violently and kill his wife. And so ultimately, Michael would be found not guilty by reason of insanity, and after only four years of psychiatric care, he was released. And today, he is still living free in Osset. But despite the legal outcomes of this case, there are many people, both religious and not religious, who believe the Michael Taylor case is one of the only true demonic possession cases in modern history. Also, just to close the loop, we don't know for sure if Michael and Marie were having an affair, but it is assumed they were. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please go to the five star review buttons place of work one minute before closing time and then proceed to browse around for about 30 minutes and then leave without buying anything. Also, please subscribe to the Mr. Ballin podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories I have posted on my YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time.